Welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this is Nikki Glazer. I'm so excited to talk to you. Nikki is a comic, a podcaster, an actor, a champion, roaster, a singer. Nikki. Oh, thank you. You have seen her on Not Safe with Nikki Glazer. Welcome home, Nikki Glazer. F Boy Island, the cancel, the, the disappeared F Boy Island. Please tell me that it's coming back in some way or another. The masked singer. So many other appearances. Her most recent HBO special was called Good Clean Filth. And you can also see her live across the world right now on her Good Girl Tour. Hi, Nikki. How are you? Hi, I'm so good. Thank you for um, reminding me of all my achievements because some days you just kind of go, what what am I doing? You know, it's nice to it's nice to have someone rattle off all the things you've done. You just did like a gratitude list for me that I don't need to do today now. So thank you. Well, um, that's my gratitude list. Uh, <laughs> that's so great. Uh, I, tr- I, I actually owe I'm doing this thing this year where I think I saw like Jay Shetty, one of those like guys on Instagram who's telling you how to live a better life and who has like piercing blue eyes. He told me that uh, the beginning of the year you write down Um, every Sunday or pick a day, every day, uh, uh, once a week, you write down a list of good things that happened that week. And then you put it in a bucket or a jar or something. I put it in one of those water containers that I bought the huge ones that say like, keep going, girl, you're (laughs) almost there. Like have little markers on it. I'm not using that for water. So now I'm putting in notes of like good stuff that happened this week. Um, but, uh, and a good thing that I will say is I do think FY Island will be somewhere else soon. I yeah. don't know anything for sure. Um, I just usually I'm pretty pessimistic about this industry. And like, you know, every time I get a show I'm and people are like, congratulations, I'm like, it's going to get canceled. So let's all hold, let's all chill because every show does, unless you're like Seinfeld or, you know, a limited series. So I'm always very pessimistic. And like people say things, oh, you know, we'll circle back around on, we'll find a new home for it. But actually I do think F boy Island is the one out of all of these times where I'm like, Oh, I think they're right. It will be somewhere else. I'm really glad. Cause I, I am sure I was not alone in being like, that does not make sense when that happened. So yeah, you weren't alone. And it kind of was just a indication of how effed up everything is in t- streaming and television and, you know, uh, buyouts and what happens like it was just like wait the successful show is going with what's, what's happening here like what we don't understand so we were confused but yeah it's um it was it was so nice to have everyone upset when something goes away you like it was a resurgence of like oh people love this so it was, it was in a you know weird way nice <laughs> And you have, I mean, you do not have all of your eggs in one basket at all. You've got a podcast, you, you're you on tour, you've got like a million other things. I want to ask about- I have so many eggs, except not like not so much down there anymore. You know, yeah. those yeah. are- yeah. <laughs> I just went to go freeze them and uh, you like, I'm 38 and I went to go check just like, how many eggs do I have? Like, and you just think you're going to defy it. Like they're going to be like, you have as much eggs as you had when you were, you know, 14 or whatever, you know, when you have the most. And um, they're like, no, your eggs are 38. And I'm like, oh, damn it. So um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm actually not freezing my eggs. So that's one last egg in my basket. Cause what a c- conundrum that is. But um, yeah, I, have a, I, I love being busy. I love doing projects that are fun. So it's my kind of like new litmus is of course I want to make money. Of course I want to, make things that are seen, but I don't even watch most of the stuff I do. I just do it for the experience. So I'm, I've I've, obviously I want people to enjoy it, but I'm in this now to like, I'm stable enough where I like to just accept jobs that where I'm like going to challenge myself or meet new people or just have a really fun day on set. So I'm, I'm lucky enough now to do that. Well, I want to get back to the egg freezing and what made you say like, Oh yeah. You know what? Nah. Like what was that? Well, that was huge. That was like my biggest. um, So I, I I think there were a couple of factors that led me to even want to do it. Cause I never, I've never really wanted kids. I've always said like, it's not for me, but I always reserve the right to change my mind about that. And I know certain things happen to you. You meet certain, you meet someone and you're like, I need to have a baby with this person. So I always was like, Oh no, I'm not going to write it off, but it's never been something I've wanted. Um, and then I think it was the Jennifer Aniston art article that came out maybe in the winter where she said that she regretted not freezing her eggs. 
And then I have a friend, Natasha Legero, who just had a book come out, came out, um, that came out called, um, you're welcome for my children. It was something like that. It's like, it's about being a parent and being like, my child's the best. And she, she has a baby and she is a friend of mine, but in that book, um, or in her promotional tour that I saw for it, she was like, do what I did, freeze your eggs when you're 38, have them when you're 41. And I just kept getting all these like reminders of like, do it now. This is the last year. I'm 38, 38 and uh, over 38 and a half. My birthday's in June. So I was like really worried about it. But then I, I started going through the process. I went and got checked. I went and like, I was about to pay for the meds, which for one time is, was $7,000 for me to, for the meds for one time, not to mention the, the procedure that I pay for. So it's about $12,000. I have the money to do that, but I just was like, I'm not charging $7,000 at a Walgreens. Like I can't do it. Like I, my receipt better be like, you know, well, uh, I compete with a CVS one from, you know, five years ago. Like it should be, I just felt weird being like, maybe I'll get some free cover girl stuff out of this. If I get coupons, like $7,000, what are my, that stop me in my tracks? Yeah. Like, I mean, that would be worth it then. Like at least if you, yeah. Get if I get a lots of makeup and body wash and, you know, um, Valentine's day boxed candy out of it. And you know, I'm just thinking of things I sell at Walgreens then yes, worth it. But I think it was that number that stopped me in my tracks and thought of all the other things I could do with it. Like I, I just, and I think it was really something that I, I cried a lot about to my doctor because I would go into these, this clinic for my, you know, exams and leading up to it. And there was this Christmas tree with all these ornaments that the kids, that kids who had been conceived there made. And so all the ornaments said something like never give up. You know, I, I exist because my mom, still had hope. I keep having hope. It's all, you know, just trying to give women hope. And I'm for women in the waiting room that are like, Oh, I want a baby so bad. And I just was like, not one of those ornaments spoke to me, not one of them. And I was like, what am I doing here? And then I realized I was really doing it so that if I met a man in the future, if my boyfriend who I don't want to have kids with now, like we don't want kids, but if he dies or breaks up with me or I break up with him, if I meet someone else and they insist on having their own baby, that's why I'm doing this for like, if I meet a guy, this guy, it was just like, I was doing it because I have no problem adopting. If I want a kid, I really, I inside myself, I'm like, there's no, I would like, it would be fun. I don't know. I, I think, I think I would enjoy it, but I do know that men tend to like want their own. Cause you know, just whatever our narcissism, but also your subconscious when like, we all kind of want our own. Um, but my friends were like, no, men don't want to adopt. And so it got in my head that I was just doing this for a future man that didn't exist. And I was like, what am I doing? And so I just, um, I just decided to not do it. And boy, on the other side of a decision to not freeze my eggs is like freedom. Because before I was just so, I was crying about it all the time to my friends. And I'm not a crier. I'm not someone who gets this emotional about decisions. Um, but it was just, I felt I was doing it because of Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> <laughs> peer pressure <laughs> if I could consider her a peer and um and you know just like I'm different than other than most women I think most women do have a desire to have a baby and be a mother and I there's a part of me that feels like there are a lot of me that don't there's so many women that don't but the majority I would say and a lot of my friends do want it so I just feel like I should too and I think I'm just embracing that part of myself that might actually know what I want which I'm always questioning Nikki, it sounds to me, honestly, like the way I would feel about buying a gun. Like, I hope I never have to use this, but like, just in case. Like, yeah. In case. Yes. That was a thing. It was just it, it, buying insurance. And that's what everyone said. It's like, it'll give you peace of mind. All I can say is it was not giving me peace of mind. I was like, there was no part of me that was like, I'm in control of my body and like getting ready to stab myself every day. It felt like I'm just doing this for a future man that I'm going to resent because he won't adopt with me. <laughs> he won't let us adopt. Right. Like I'm mad at this imaginary man. Right. You know what I'll do? If he wants his own kid, it's not like he wants me and his kid. He just wants him in it. We'll pick up some models, like some chick. Well, that'll be fun. We'll look through a catalog of women together and pick out a donor egg and, you know, and that'll be a fun thing for us to share as a couple. Nikki, I want to ask, cause like just talking to you right now, like the way that you're talking you are so good at being intimate and vulnerable and talking about things that are really personal, especially personal to women. 
And yet, you know, you also, I think a lot of people who know you very superficially know you like, she's the lady from the road. She's the lady yeah. who talks about sex. She's really raunchy. That's, that's like the most superficial kind of understanding of it that, you know, God bless, like you've made a name for yourself out of that. Yeah. I of- could just be that and that would be right. fine. But that's not who you are. <laughs> the way that you talk about like eating disorders and vulnerability and body image, all of those things, and talking just now about like whether or not you want to freeze your crying over freezing your eggs is right. like, a whole other side of you. And I want to know how that's affected your comedy. Like, are you in this special, in this tour that you're doing? What are the thing? What is the storytelling that's evolving? Because I know you've also said that you've you've really worked more lately in the last few years on be more of a storyteller in your comedy. Yeah, I I just, I guess I wanted to be, I want my jokes to have a lasting impression. I want them to maybe shift people's way of thinking about something because that's what the best standup has done for me where it's just like suddenly changed the way I look at that thing the rest of my life or made me feel, you know, obviously less alone. And I feel like that's the goal. And um, I think that, yeah, that side of myself that's vulnerable, I just... The more that I get, the the older I get and the less I care what people think, which is something that like wears away as you age, obviously. Um, I just know that I feel closest to people. I feel the best when I share the most. Like I need to get it out. It's like, it benefits me just as much as I feel like it benefits other people. And I know that it benefits other people because I was dying for the celebrities I looked up to, to be a little bit more honest when I was in high school or, or, and, and, and even now, like there, there are disappointments I have in celebrities that I really like because of how fake everything is. And so I'm always trying to keep it very real. And I honestly, it's how it's impacted. My career could be negative. Like not everyone wants to hear every little aspect of your life. You kind of get known as like the girl who overshares uh, I can't help it. And it's the only way for me to to process it and get over it. I'm actually, you know, I, I'm looking to, towards being a singer songwriter at some point in my career because it would be a less overt um, and annoying potentially way of expressing my feelings and then stand up because stand up is so direct, so, uh, you know, exact and uh, detailed. And I, I need to be a little bit more nuanced in my messaging or like my emotions, but it's, um, it's something I can't help. And, uh, and I feel like the, just the artists that I'm most attracted to in terms of stand up, stand up are the ones that are just the most that are telling you shit that you're like, oh, they've had some sort of breakthrough where they're not just telling like, I shit my pants. Like that's vulnerable in a way, but they're telling like, I got in a fight with my wife and this is how I felt about it. Like that kind of thing where you're like, oh, I'm a fly on the wall suddenly. This is very vulnerable. That's that's all very interesting to me. It's, it's just, I'm doing it for sake of being interesting because I know that's what I'm attracted to as a, a consumer, but I'm also doing it for myself because it makes me feel better when I get these things out. Yeah, I'm, and I want to ask you about the singing because it feels like this has been a breakthrough for you. You went on The Masked Singer, you mm-hmm. slayed, you you did a Kelly Clarkson song, and then you went on Kelly Clarkson's show and talked about it. I mean, oh my God, <laughs> Nikki, that is like I know. next level bravery. Like, I really, really think that is just like next level. Now, it's, yeah, bravery or stupidity or like, uh, yeah, a little cringe sometimes. Like these are the, the these are the things you, ri- you risk looking stupid when you try something new. And, and that for me is singing is like, ugh, I'm like, I'm at an open mic or stage in terms of like, n- people shouldn't be seeing this yet, but you have to stop the fast singer. And it's all a part of, the, you know, the growth. I think it's interesting to see people uh, grow at, at, at like, at something they're trying, especially as an adult. So I, I'm letting people in on that, even though it's kind of embarrassing sometimes. <laughs> trying and, and continuing to try and not feeling like, well, I learned everything when I was 22, so now I don't have to learn anything. I don't have to be a beginner anymore. Like the idea yeah. of a beginner is so powerful, right? And you're letting yourself be a beginner of something. Yes, and in front of people, like I, I, but that's the only way I can do it. I think that I'm, for whatever reason, like, I like getting good at something with an audience. It pressures me to get good at it. It puts the pressure on for me to practice more and to be like, so, and I was thinking about it the way with that I got good at stand up was in front of a crowd every single time. You can't do stand up in front of your stuffed animals. You can't do it 
just telling jokes to your friends. Like the only way to get good is to go up in front of people and be really bad. Like you have to be a literal stage one beginner to go on stage for the first time. There's no way that you can prepare for that moment. So with music though, I think it's so much of like, don't put this out, like practice in your room and, and get good kind of by yourself and then debut it. And for me, I've been, um, I do this thing on, I just, uh, I have like way le less followers on my podcast, um, Instagram account. And so I go live on there and I just practice guitar on there with an audience because it keeps me accountable. I practice way more and I learn how to perform too. Cause I'm like, you know, trying to step it up. So performing as a singer. So I, um, yeah, that is, that, that's been the greatest part about being a beginner at something at a level where you can practice in front of people. I, I always tell people like, even if you have one person watching on your Instagram, like create a account and like practice in front of someone, keep you accountable. Um, and yeah, so, but I love showing people that you can improve. I started playing guitar, uh, two and a half years ago and I like, like, I'm pretty good. I'm good enough that I can like sing to play anything, you know, and find some way to play it. And I would have never thought that, like, I just always thought like you either got it or you don't like you can learn things and singing. I mean, that's something I always thought you either have it or you don't, you're born with it or you're not, but it is singing. Your voice is the most complex instrument. I'm trying, I'm learning to find out. And that's, that opened up a world to me when I started looking at it as an instrument rather than like, did, are you a singer or not? Did you have, were, were born one or not? Like, no, you can you can be trained. I mean, you, it's, it's harder for some people and easier for others, but, um, that's, that's a whole world that's opening up to me where I'm like, man, I, I would have started doing this earlier and looked at it this way, but, um, I'm grateful now. So I'm like, it's, it, and it's, and I like to be bad at something. I like to be challenged. So I think I was really longing for something new to really, uh, test me and make me nervous again and get like that adrenaline. It's good to be afraid of things. And that I think that that idea of like, either you do it, like either you're good at something or you're not, is such a way of letting yourself off the hook for trying and being bad at things and letting yourself be embarrassed and be bad at things. And I want to ask you about this because I'm not going to sing Kelly Clarkson songs in a, in a snow costume. Right. As far as I know. But all of us know what it's like to feel like, oh, people only see me one way. Like everybody, like my family sees me as the this one or my my yes. mom sees me as this one people see me as this and when you do something different it does feel really scary and it does feel like people are going to push back and be like oh that's not you like you don't wear that whether it's like you don't wear that color or you're not the one who does this like we yes yes and i want to know like how like what would be your advice when you're like i want to be oh my somebody god who's red i want to be somebody who sings right wanna, like how do you do that that is such a good question and completely is, is one that I'm excited to answer because it, I am someone who always feels like I, I'm not like the others. I can't do that thing. And the thing that I think of is like, if you think people are going to judge you a lot, it's probably cause you're judging others a lot. And cause I, my biggest fear is like, people talk about me behind my back. They screenshot something I'm doing. And then they start a chat about me and make fun of me. And I know now from being a person who does that, that the only reason I ever make fun of someone or go, oh, what is she wearing? Oh my God, she thinks she's so hot or ew, this is so cringe. It's because I'm jealous that they are willing to take a risk that I never would. And so in order to convince myself that I shouldn't take that risk that I really want to take, I wish I could wear that. I wish I could dress slutty sometimes and post it on Instagram, not give a shit. But in order for me to keep that story in my head of like, that's why you don't do it, Nikki. I need to bully those people in my mind to, to make myself think, well, if you do this to them, if you do that, they're going to do it to you. So as soon as I kind of realize that disconnect of like, if someone's making fun of you or what people are going to say, like, that it's only because they're insecure. Cause I, I know I only do it when I'm insecure. I was able to like, let it go a little bit. It still hurts. I did get made fun of. Like I released a song about Bob Saget when he died and like, it was fine, but they're comics who have to be tough and make fun of everything. And like nothing, everything sincere is gay or whatever the hell they have, you know, but they're desperate to sing. And so I look at it that way. And, um, I also really just have more gotten into like, uh, I don't know. 
if I want to do something, it's probably because I like really like it. It might make me happier, you know? And so just take the risk and just know they are talking about you behind your own back you're, and, and, and live out your biggest fear. Okay. So then your sister makes fun of you with your other siblings of like, what is she driving? What does she wear? Like, okay, then what happens? Okay. Then they, they like become better friends because of it. And you don't get to be, I just like play it out. And I'm like, I don't friends with them anyway. They kind of suck, like whatever it ends up being. Um, and then my biggest secret to like doing something you're scared to do is just set a date where like sign up for an open mic, sign up for an art class, like do set the stage for something, but spend $300 on a red shirt that you, cause you want to start like do something where you're like, I can't back out of this. Like I can't spend that much money on something that I won't wear. Set yourself up. So you have to do it down the road and you will not want to, you will kick and scream. You will look for ways to weasel out. But if it's, if you, if you pick something good enough where you can't like pick something that you feel like you can't weasel out of, and then you just have to do it. I mean, that's how I conquered stage fright. That's how I conquered going up on open mics. Seventh grade, I signed up for a play and I didn't want to do a play. I wanted to so bad, but I used to sit, shake on stage. My knees would shake. My voice would crack. Like I couldn't handle stage fright, but I knew I wanted to be famous quote unquote someday. So I just signed up for a play that was happening months later. And I was like, oh, I'll get, I'll get over it by then. I didn't, but I had to, once you do it, you realize it's not that bad. And then you can do it again and again. It's just that first time. Right. And like, if the worst thing that happens is you're embarrassed, then be embarrassed. It's okay. I want to ask you one Being more thing. It won't kill you. Being No one's ever died of embarrassment. It really will be okay. And like people move on from things so fast. It'll be like a day of feeling embarrassed, but you will survive it. I mean, Believe you, me, I got it. first voted off Dancing with the Stars and it was something I deeply cared about. I got eliminated from TV, a TV show that is pretty much a popularity contest it, at, the, at my stage that I was at. And I was eliminated first. I was wearing a red sequined, like I looked like Jean Benet Ramsey had she like survived and never like kept like never emotionally developed. I literally was dressed like, you know, the little, like a little, it was so humiliating. And then Tom Bergeron says my name first to go home. No one even cares. First voted off. People are just like, get out of here. It was the most embarrassing moment of my life. And I really cared about that show. I know after, after that I can survive anything. Nothing will compare to that embarrassment in my life. Hopefully. And, uh, and it was the best thing that happened to me. Cause it's so funny to be eliminated first. It was, it's not funny at all to be eliminated third. There's no story there. Right. But, um, so I, I think just like throw yourself into getting embarrassed and, and real, that's how you realize like, oh, I can take more chances. And then you can own that story. Nikki, I have to just ask you one more thing. I, I, cause I, you're talking about all of these things that you've done that you keep trying to do. I know you're a very success driven person. What is success or achievement? look like to you now at this stage in your life? You're really good at questions. Um, <laughs> this I mean, truly, I've been interviewed like uh, 19 times this week and these are great questions. Um, success to me, I guess it's, it really is like the um, admiration of my peers or people that I look up to that I think are cool and funny and which I have a lot of that. So I'm kind of like, there are days where I'm like, uh, I could be done. Like, I don't know, hosting SNL one day would be cool. But that again is a popularity contest. Like I've, I don't like, and so there's parts of it that go, I don't really, like I went to the, um, I was nominated for a Critics Choice Award, which was very cool. It was like my first nomination for my HBO special. And I went to the Critics Choice Awards and I just was like looking around, like this is, it kind of feels like middle school play. Like, like we're all dressing up and like pretending that TV and film are like so important when really in the scheme of things, no offense, not that much. I, I art is obviously like, it's, all, it's why we're both here. We love it. Thank you. But like, it just, the things the, winning that award or going to the Oscars or winning that stuff. Just, I just, every time I go to an award show, I have I get a little depressed because I see it for what it is. And I'm just like, these are just people that want to be liked so bad. It's a popularity contest. I miss my dogs and my niece and nephew. It starts to be like, what's really important here. So success to me is really just, um, getting to work with fun people continually and staying relevant enough that I can sell tickets because touring really does make me feel great. And it's a, like a litmus test of if they like me, they really like me. And and just being able to like 
uh, make people feel better with, with my voice, like in whatever way that is. So through podcasting, I just, I hope to always be able to do that, you know, and hopefully forever. I, I, I don't think I'll ever tire of talking and, and trying to speak up for people who might feel like the weird or, or just women or, you know, just, um, people with anxiety, depression, animals. I'm, you know, a vegan. So I think maybe success will be finding a way to weave in vegan um, activism a little bit more and, and do something for the world in, in that way. So it's it's ever evolving. But um, yeah, I think I kind of answered it. I gotta, I gotta go back to my vision board. It's just okay. all Theo James's face. I just, gotta put more goals on there. Just share it and we'll, we'll, all, we'll all add some. <laughs> we'll just put on, put on all those, um, all those eggs. Um, yeah. <laughs> Nikki, thank you so much for talking to me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Nikki Glazer, people can see you live on stage all across the world right now. We can listen to you on your podcast. We can watch you on a million different things and keep our fingers crossed for the return of F-Boy Island. Yes. Thank you so much. This was so nice. I appreciate you.